So I'm going to, uh, I prepared myself for the 15 minutes, so I'm not going to get into details of too many things, but what I'm trying to do is present an overview of what has happened to the women's world of work in the entire, uh, uh, I mean, the whole of this year, beginning from the lockdown and in the current phase. But uh, as I started thinking about what I could do in these 15 minutes, I uh, realized that it would be very, um, I mean, it would be unjust to actually talk about only the challenges that has emerged for women uh, in this current phase because they are not in isolation of the past challenges that women faced in the world of work for quite a long uh, period, in fact, almost a decade. And one of the concerns that we have had uh, as uh, economists working with women labor has been the secularly declining and very low work participation rates of women in India, and uh, which is where I thought that it would be prudent for me to give a brief background about the challenges that women faced in a pre-COVID world in India, and also then have a continuation on that um, based on the insights that we have got from some of the IVH studies over this period, and also uh, IVH partnerships, IVH uh, studies, and also some of the studies uh, that our partners conducted independently. So having said that, I just want to, I'll take a, I'll just share my screen and run you through this uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. So I hope you can see my screen. And so this is the this is how I structured the uh, slides to understand what were the pre-COVID challenges in women's world of work, and then the COVID challenges in the work continuum during and after lockdown. So one of the important slides, and I think this is a slide which whoever who has been working with women's labor, it's a very familiar uh, graph that I'm presenting, that in spite of the decent levels of economic growth barring the last two years, the decline in fertility rates of women in India improved schooling of girls, female labor force participation rate has declined in both rural and urban areas since the late 90s, since the early 90s, and the female labor force participation has been as low as on an average 20% over the last decade, which has been the lowest among the fastest growing economies of the world. And um, this is a contradictory experience that India has had because given the first few parameters that I talked about, the global experience has been that of an increase in the female labor force participation, but our labor official statistics shows us that despite such improvements, we have not been able to uh, improve our labor force participation rates for women. And along with that, we also have to understand that how are women distributed across the self-employed and wage-employed uh, uh, workers in the country and what we find is that we have a substantial more than 50% of women are uh, remain engaged as self-employed workers out of which out of which the share of unpaid family workers is a very high share which is around 31% so we have 53% women as self-employed workers out of which we have 31% as unpaid family workers, workers, which is to say that this is about those women who work in family agricultural uh, fields or family firms, that is family enterprises, family business, small businesses, uh, uh, shops owned by the families. And those work of women are recognized as work but they, are, they remain unpaid because that is taken as a contribution to the family. So although they are recognized as self-employed women, they still remain unpaid for their contribution to the economic activity. Other than that, what we have is own account workers, women own account workers, which is basically women's small businesses, 
and uh, micro businesses. And this is something that is very important to us in this entire COVID period, because what we have seen, one of the most important segments of women's work that got very hurt, uh, badly hurt in the entire lockdown, where uh, I'll come to that later. But this is one of the important segments, which is also one of the uh, emphasis of the government to expand, basically, to um, make, to turn women into to, to into entrepreneurs and to basically provide them with facilities to create and develop their own businesses. Because what we have seen in the past is that women generally get into enter enterprises, small micro nano enterprises, not out of any aspiration or entrepreneurial aspirations that we talk about, but mostly out of necessities. And that is something that we should keep in mind uh, when we talk about what has happened in this year, in the COVID year, because uh, necessity driven entrepreneurship and aspiration driven entrepreneurships are very different qualitatively having said that we also find that the regular work of women is substantial in um, uh, in in in, in uh, the entire um, uh, uh, labor force uh, participation that women have but i would also like to highlight that regular wage employment for women although has increased over the last 10 years especially in urban areas but these are employment which lack any jo written job contract where women are ineligible for paid leaves with no social security benefits so basically what we find is there has been an increase in regular wage employment where women are paid at a regular interval but in, in for under informal setups that is to say that they do not have any remunerations or any sort of uh, non-wage remunerations which we are uh, link with decent work and um, uh, it is also important to highlight that there exist substantial wage gaps between men and women in this form of employment uh, it is also to highlight that some of the other challenges that the pre-COVID or normally that women faced in the labor market were the wage gaps or the earning gaps. And the earning gaps in self-employment is much higher than the earning gaps for women in wage employment. Um, and to highlight that almost 94% of all women's employment is informal and remains con concentrated in sectors like agriculture. If we leave out agriculture, more than 75% of total female non-agricultural employment is again informal in nature and remains concentrated in specific sectors uh, in which are essentially low paid and have um, uh, very less low value added in terms of uh, low and also low productive, which is basically domestic uh, women remain engaged as domestic workers or within construction as street vendors in beauty manufacturing industries, which is a very big sector in home-based work for women, where women remain engaged. And women are also found in garment factories as waste pickers uh, in the cities and so on. So you can see that the range of sectors that women are engaged in are essentially informal, low paid, and heavy manual-based activities. Having said that, there is another challenge, which is the challenge of invisibilization of women's work, which women continuously face, which is basically the issues of non-recognition and uh, measurement, uh, uh, measurement of women's contribution to the economy, which doesn't fall under the traditional labor market, but it definitely contributes to the entire economy and society women's, and I'm talking about women's contribution to the unpaid work in the economy. And uh, if, we, if we look at the current recently released Time News survey, which was conducted in 2019, we would find that women spend almost five hours more on unpaid work than men in a day, and a work and, uh, and a normal work day for women is essentially two hours longer than a normal work day for for men and some of the and one of the important insights that the time use surveys provide us with all its limitations i'm not going to get into that would answer questions if there are any but just to highlight that while the 
the Time News survey tells us that while the 711 minutes of men's work are well recognized and remunerated for, the uh, the 500 uh, minutes, 518 plus minutes of women's work are non-recognized as work and does not get counted and uh, therefore and therefore remain unremunerated. And this is a process where women's work gets undervalued and invisibilized and also to an extent that the official statistics cannot count and do not show a large number of women as work uh, as working although they do they do a lot of work in their um, in the domain which is which does not fall into the traditional labor market and uh, this remains true for all countries but india has a special case because it is much more um, uh, severe in india however having laid out these challenges some of the important things that emerged in the lockdown around this year would be one of the important things that um, even my previous speaker was trying to talk about in terms of when she was talking about the migrant workers. Women, there has, studies have shown, several studies together, taken together, including IVH studies, have shown loss of income by up to 80% in extreme cases, job losses in all sectors which have over-representation of women's, women, that is those sectors that I just spoke about. In certain factories, what we have found is, and this is something that I'm talking from a small uh, research which was supported by IVH, that job cuts have been more than 50% for women. And what women migrant workers have faced has been a lack of place to stay. Uh, uh, and this has happened precisely because if we look at women migrant workers, uh, the conditions of women migrant workers during the uh, lockdown period was pathetic, one uh, was, was extremely uh, hurtful in the sense that one, women migrants were not really part of the discourse. It was a migrant worker discourse and it was not, and, and the discourse was more about uh, migrant workers which was not focused on women and hence when we saw women, women were depicted as being part of the migrant family and not workers by themselves. So there was a problem of uh, visibilizing the women migrant in the initial part of the lockdown, which basically means that women were out of the announcements or the benefits that were being provided by the government. And therefore, uh, and also we found out that a lot of women migrant workers who worked at construction sites did not have the identity cards, which basically registers them, registers them as workers and therefore could not get anything from the government benefit government beneficiary programs um, the the so so this was part of the migrant uh, work but however on the other hand what we found in some of our so so um, we have been working with the national rural livelihoods mission very closely at iwage and we have been um, we are working in five states and what we have uh, seen or this is not part of the study but some information that we kept getting in and which was corroborated by all the media report that there has been a potential loss of work under mg and rega for women while there has been an increased demand for narega workers but for women in some parts, in specific regions, there has been a loss of work because more returning male migrants to those regions claimed the Narega jobs, pushing out women from those, uh, those employment. So having said this, so there was one way in which women got pushed out from some employment that they used to get in a pre-COVID world. In, on the other hand, the other challenges got more ex, uh, the got got more acute because what we found from a Seva IVH Seva study of informal workers in Jharkhand and West Bengal, we found that seventy percent of women Bili workers did not get enough employment or did not get enough work during the lockdown, and uh, currently even now. When we are in a complete unlock, the supply of work for women daily workers has not been restored. Uh, when we talk about the small businesses, uh, the IVG and LEED studies in, the, in, in Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu, 
uh, and uh, showed uh, for women's businesses in handlooms and handicrafts actually showed uh, uh, loss of uh, disruptions in supply chains, impact of I mean uh, labor shortages, lack of demand, and also an exclusion of women because of increased digital dependence for market access, where essentially women lack the skill for getting digitally included. So that also created a a uh, greater challenge for women during the lockdown where there was a high digital dependence of businesses on accessing market as well as accessing inputs. So for small women entrepreneurs, that was a real challenge. And since, as I said, that most women entrepreneurship has come out of necessity rather than entrepreneurial um, uh, aspirations, what we found that these businesses were either getting temporarily closed or some of them were getting permanently closed because of lack of technical abilities. Um, and uh, and on, on, on top of that, what small businesses also faced was um, challenge uh, 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 was was another uh, was another small challenge uh, small challenge uh, of. Um, uh, access to credits because uh, I mean uh, not access to credits but also um, access to the moratoriums that the loan facilities or the government had announced because many of the uh, women actually were uh, dependent on loans that they took from friends and family and were using capital from their own savings and not from the government's uh, uh, programs and therefore the moratoriums actually did not help the women entrepreneurs as much as it could have helped the, as as much as it help the bigger businesses or the bigger ventures. So these were some of the challenges that uh, were uh, uh, that, that we actually got to know when we went into the field for uh, investigating the small enterprises of women. Uh, apart from that, there's a third segment which got exploited uh, in the entire uh, lockdown period were the SHG members and the women frontline workers like the ashas and the anganwadi workers now these workers anyways the ashas and the anganwadis are anyways entrusted with a lot of activities and a lot of responsibilities over and above the health um, uh, over and above their usual activities in any rural areas what we found and what uh, is has been a very uh, common knowledge by now that uh, for those who have been following how women have been behaving in the rural areas that women anganwadi asha workers and the shg members have been marked as community leaders fighting they uh, the covid basically they have been called the covid warriors however our study in bihar and telangana for the women frontline workers revealed that while women were performing many additional activities, there were no extra funds allocated for their PPEs. And this became a furor across the country. It was not only our study, it became a uh, thing for the entire country and the allocation started coming in much later. However, what was interesting in our study was that Telangana, which was one of the first front runners of increasing the honorariums for ASHA workers to 6,000 rupees last year was one of the first states which actually uh, went into a reduction of 10% on their payments in the lockdown period. So there was even, even, even frontline workers who are basically some a kind of, who are engaged in basically some kind of public employment, they also faced income losses in this period. And the, and the last thing that I want to highlight is that all women, all women who were basically catering to the retur returning migrants in rural areas and women who stayed put in the urban areas faced an increased burden of unpaid work. One, because they had been facing job losses and if they are at home, the uh, the, the burden of unpaid domestic chores kind of increases and also because government schools and other school facilities were closed and children were at home, the burden of unpaid work on women increased. In fact, one of the field studies um, uh, and some of the other media reports, if we take them together, we find that 66% of women indicated an increase in unpaid work and 36% reported increased burden of child and elderly care work 
world during this period. So having said this, what I want to end with is by saying that the challenges that women faced in a pre-COVID world of labor market inequalities, which I presented briefly in the first part, and what are the current challenges, the current persistent challenges are not very different in nature. We have a problem of women not getting adequate employment, women not getting expected uh, uh, forms of employment. And here we have in the current form, a crisis, an employment crisis that we are undergoing where women are actually being pushed out actively from the workforce. So what has happened in the lockdown and post lockdown is that the challenges that we had has become, has turned, become manifold and is affecting not only women's status within the labor market, but generally their well-being in the overall uh, economy and society. And there have been, and we have been recommending a lot of policy measures. We have been working with the closely with the NWCD and uh, the Ministry of Women and Child Development, Ministry of Rural Development, and also with the Niti Aayog, but I'm not getting into those. I'll speak to that if there are any questions. Thank you.